30 seconds and counting. 25 seconds and counting, we are still go. 20 seconds, guidance alert, the guidance system now going internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Good evening and welcome to an unusual episode of The Angry Astronaut where I have a little bit of a different setup today and this is courtesy of our guest producer Joel Ryder um, and he has done a number of things for me in the past including a live stream or two um, but in addition to that he's done a lot of my filming uh, for any of the uh, events that take place here in the south of England. Um, so everybody, uh, express your, uh, thanks to him because this is the only reason I'm able to do this today since my, uh, usual producer ASN is not available. Um, he's, uh, in London, uh, enjoying some time, um, with his, with his missus. So in any event, uh, just want to see where's everybody checking in from. Oh, by the way, happy Easter. Um, hello, Romania. Thank you very much for checking in. We also have Nigeria. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you checking in today. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, just waiting for some other folks to uh, to check in. Um, once again, I hope everybody is having a, uh, a good Easter. Oh, I want to thank John Depker right off the bat uh, for giving out five uh, angry astronaut memberships. We've got five new angry advocates. Really, really appreciate that, John. Thank you so much for doing that. You guys are going to get an invitation, um, via, uh, YouTube, uh, giving you a link as to how to become part of our discord server, um, which is one of a number of different benefits. Uh, we got West Palm beach in Florida and we got, uh, Finland, we got Texas, Stockholm, Indianapolis, Hamburg, uh, we got South Georgia, uh, French, Kanakistan, Houston, we got Ohio, Chicago, Brooklyn, New York City, I always love Brooklyn, uh, Devon, Colorado, I'm going to be out in Colorado soon, hello Israel, thank you very much for checking in, we've got Scotland, Ontario, Manchester, um, we have Saudi Arabia. Hello. Thank you very much for checking in. We have Clifton, Ireland, um, Mulheim on Ruhr in Germany. Uh, and thanks very much, Carl, for checking in as always. Uh, let's see. So yeah, looks like, uh, quite a number of people checking in. We have, uh, geez, 180 people viewing already. We have Miami, Scotland, uh, hello, Russia. Thank you very much for checking in. We got Vancouver, um, upstate, New York. Uh, we also have Western Wales, UK, Germany, uh, Michigan. We got Ohio, Netherlands, Honolulu. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, St. Louis, Cape Town, South Africa. As always, people from all over the world really appreciate you guys being here. Oh, hello, England. Thank you very much for checking in. And Belgium and Tennessee, another Hamburg, Germany. Um, once again, really, really, oh, another Honolulu. Thank you very much. So again, all over the world, uh, love it when you guys check in and looking forward to, uh, to talking to you folks this evening about Mars, about Elon, about what's going on with, uh, with Starship and, uh, and the state of our objectives of, of our goals or our ambitions or rather SpaceX's ambitions, which we share with them, we share these ambitions with them, of course, of going to Mars. 
I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Elon was actually seriously talking about an unmanned landing on Mars in 2022 and a manned landing on Mars, a, a crew rated, uh, human rated landing on Mars in 2024. Um, obviously, that was uh, that was very aspirational, aspirational in the extreme. And now we're left wondering, is this even going to happen by 2030, which after all is only six years away and Starship has made progress definitely, but still has a very, very long way to go before we're actually going to be looking at a realistic um, manned mission to Mars utilizing uh, Starship. Um, so, you know, let's go ahead and, and kind of cover what we think is, is, is likely to happen. It is, first of all, is Elon going to give up on this? No, I don't think so. Elon is really, really determined to get to Mars. So many things that he does with SpaceX, especially if we're talking about rushing things, which he does. He rushes things quite a lot, um, you know, and, and puts a lot of pressure on his his uh, his employees at SpaceX, you know, a lot of that revolves around his objective of at least seeing mankind land on the surface of the red planet um, before he dies. You know, so there's obvious that that pressure that that focus is still there. I think that's that's very clear. However, there certainly are a number of things that have happened. Um, over the last couple of years that have been distractions, um, kind of, in, in my opinion, sort of unwanted distractions. Twitter has been a huge, huge anchor around Elon's head in many respects. Yeah, he wants to accomplish some big things. And, you know, with Twitter, he has big objectives there. And that's fine. I respect that. But, you know, those are the sorts of objectives that could really you know, make uh, your focus on Mars getting a little bit more disrupted. Um, by the way, Marina says, absolutely agree. Preparing for Mars takes time. And things are going on here on Earth. Hello, Marina, by the way. Thank you very much um, for tuning in. Marina is our Ukrainian uh, viewer and supporter. Um, has been with the channel now for a very, very long time, a uh, long relationship that we've had with Marina. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, and everybody, everybody be nice to Marina because uh, she's obviously been living through some tough times over the last couple of years. Okay, so yeah, 2030, um, we have a comment here that 2030 seems, it seems very possible that we might be able to land on Mars uh, by 2030. I agree, actually. So let's see what would be necessary. What would have to happen in order for a landing on Mars by 2030 to be realistic? Robert, thank you so much for the $10. Really, really appreciate that. That's only your fifth super chat of, of all time on the live stream. I think he's just driven and that shows in his work attitude. Absolutely. I agree. He's a very driven person. Um, one of the most driven people in business today. Um, you know, and it's tough to keep up with that sometimes. I think it's very difficult for some of his employees to, to contend with that. Um, by the way, again, Robert, thank you so much for the $10 and the support. Right now, all of my focus is on getting to space symposium, leaving on the 8th of April. We're only talking a week and a half away. Um, all I need is a plane ticket. Everything else is covered for that. Space Symposium is the biggest space-related co conference in the United States. And I've been invited to attend as an accredited journalist for free, um, which most people pay 500 bucks minimum to attend this thing. And there's all the big players are going to be there. All of the big space flight companies will be there. So I absolutely need to be there. Um, if for no other reason I want to see Sierra Space, um, they're interested in giving me another interview to catch me up on what's going on. So in any event, any support that I can get for that, really appreciate it. And all and you uh, details are in the description. Okay, so back to what needs to happen. Well, obviously, Starship needs to become a mature system. What does that mean? Well... It means that Starship has to reach a level of 100% reusability. We really need to get to that point 
before Elon's dreams for Mars can become a reality. Maybe we could carry out one launch, you know, one mission to Mars or something like that without 100% reusability. But, you know, really getting that level of reusability is, is an absolute essential. John, thank you so much for the tenor. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so long as it becomes, it doesn't become like fusion with the Mars colony only 20 years away. Yeah, that's a very good point. So need to get that reusability. There's a long ways to go between where Starship is now and 100% reusability. Obviously, we're closer and closer now to the booster getting to the point to where we can at least do a catch attempt. But still, with the catch attempt, we're likely to have at least a couple of failures there. And failures with catch attempts will probably involve some damage to the uh, orbital launch mounts and to the catch tower. Um, there'll probably be some damage there. It, it'd be difficult to avoid that. Um, it, it, a booster explosion will probably be about double the size of the explosions that we saw with like SN11, SN9, that sort of thing. So, you know, that that will probably slow down the process of, of getting uh, the catch process um, mastered. And then as far as landing Starship is concerned, well, we really need to get to the point to where the re-entry is 100% reliable to where Starship can make a very controlled re-entry and survive all the way down to the surface more or less intact, um, you know, in order for it to land successfully. Probably have a little ways to go there as well. If for no other reason, the heat shield seems to have some issues. Um, uh, here's a, here's a, uh, comments made, John says, uh, just seems that there's no plan for the moon or Mars. We don't have the technology to stay. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think that there are some, some challenges there. Helga, thank you so much for the 15 euros and happy Easter to you as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the heat shield for Starship needs to be better than it is now. Um, in, you know, but of course that's the, the, you know, the point of testing. That's the point of experimentation. I mean, and, and that's something we always need to remember. What I try to remind my viewers about on a regular basis, this is not the final product. There are still quite a number of things that SpaceX is not sure about. We're not certain as to, you know, how long is it going to be before we actually have a 100% mature rocket here? Um, could be a little while. And so once Starship is 100% reusable and reliably reusable, once you get to that point, that's when things really start to get catapulted forward. Because at the same time, you also are going to be developing low Earth orbit refueling. In my opinion, 100% reusability and low Earth orbit refueling will probably happen at more or less the same time. Those two processes will reach maturity at roughly the same time. John, thank you so much for the $10. Really appreciate your support. Thanks so much. So, you know, of course, as I say, those two processes will be developed side by side. But once we have reusability and low Earth orbit refueling mastered, that's when things really start to move forward rapidly. That's when things start to change. Now, of course, we are also going to have a human-rated Starship very soon. And it's nice that that Starship won that contract um, for HLS, at least as far as for fans of people who want to see us get to Mars quickly. It means that NASA is footing about $4 billion or more more closer to $5 billion worth of the bill to build a human rated starship. Now, of course, the HLS that will be landing on the moon is most probably not going to be the, the uh, life support system that will be necessary to handle a Mars journey. The life support system for landing on the moon only requires a couple of weeks uh, you know, worth of life support. Um, just keep the astronauts alive for a little while, uh, long enough to get them back to orbit and get them back to the Orion. 
um, something for Mars obviously is going to require months, if not years, worth of life support. Um, this is why we need manufacturing in space, is a point that's made here. Spacecraft only meant to stay in, in orbit, don't need heat shields. Good point. That's a very good point. Uh, John says, uh, why can't we just build an orbital reef out of Starship boosters when you give the astronauts more room? Um, yeah, it's it's certainly possible. Uh, well, out of boosters? No, probably not, because we can't get the boosters to orbit. A, a uh, super heavy booster is incapable of reaching orbit, at least as far as we know. Um, that's why you have two-stage rockets. The first stage gets Starship up to a certain altitude, and then the uh, the booster takes over. I do not believe that Super Heavy on its own can reach orbit. Um, but as far as empty Starship, sure, that's been suggested, using Starships to build a colossal space station. But, um, you know, getting back on topic as, as far as Mars is concerned, you know, once the low Earth orbit refueling process is mastered and once reusability is mastered, once we have those two things side by side, which are being developed anyway in order to achieve a lunar mission, then at that point, you have what you need to get you to Mars. However, you don't have what's necessary in order to keep astronauts alive on Mars because a Mars mission is likely to chew up a couple of years worth of time it you have to coordinate the uh the launch um I'm barely for just one moment here you need to coordinate the uh the launch with a certain time frame once every two years and i'm going to get to a couple of comments here real quick every couple of years is when you get to launch it takes about six months to get there six months to get back at least if you're using chemical rockets so that means that you have, you know, you cannot get to Mars and get back in a single launch opportunity. You have to wait until Mars and the Earth are in conjunction again. And then, you know, that's a couple of years. So a full-fledged Mars mission is going to take at least two years and probably a little bit longer, which means you need a life support system that's going to sustain the astronauts for two years, if not longer. That is going to be a tall order. That will be a challenging thing indeed. As far as unmanned missions to Mars with Starship, that can get going very soon after you have 100% reusability and low Earth orbit refueling. But a manned mission is a little bit different. Michael Maxey, thank you so much for the $20. SpaceX needs to have controlled water landings then drone ship landings before making a catch attempt. Good point and probably true. Robert De La Cruz, everyone join the, dis the Discord community. Thank you so much and for the $10. By the way, if you want to join the Discord community, you can do that for as little as three bucks. Three dollars, that's it. Go to the description and you'll see how to become a Patreon supporter at the $3 level. And then you get access to the Discord community. And the Discord community is chock full of people who know a lot about spaceflight, people who actually work in the industry. In addition to that, you get exclusive content, early release content, and you get to talk to me once a week if that's something you'd like to do. Uh, so anyway, let's get on to the, uh, the topic at hand. So yeah, a life support system that's capable of delivering astronauts on an interplanetary journey, keeping them alive all that time and then bringing them back that's a tall order. I think that it can be done, you know, definitely. But by 2030, it, it may be tough. I think it's possible. But I think that you need to be working on it right now. You need to take the life support system that you develop for a human for the HLS for going to the moon and then improving it dramatically. And most of that improvement needs to come in the form of recycling uh, vital resources, Reci recycling breathable atmosphere, recycling water, that sort of thing, growing your own uh, produce, growing, you know, growing your own supplies, your own food, et cetera, on board. All of those things needs to be de developed to a much higher level of perfection than what you need going to the moon. And herein, is another reason why NASA's moon to Mars plan is actually a pretty damn good plan, is the fact that it gives SpaceX an opportunity to build a human-rated starship that will be able to keep astronauts alive for a few weeks, 
and build on what they learn with that life support system, build on that in order to have a starship that will be able to keep astronauts alive indefinitely. So we've got that. Um, a little suggestion here that we need nuclear. Yeah, I would say so. Um, that's another thing. Nuclear propulsion and nuclear power are a couple of things that are going to be, uh, I think, very important for success on Mars. Nuclear propulsion can get us to Mars in as little as 45 days instead of six months, which completely changes the mission parameters. You can get to Mars, spend a couple of months there, and get back in a single conjunction between the two planets as opposed to having to wait two years. So nuclear changes a lot in that regard. And then, of course, nuclear power for your uh, for to you know power your life support system, electrical systems, et cetera. Nuclear power is, is far better than other solutions. Will SpaceX get access to a nuclear reactor? No, unless this the mission is done in conjunction with NASA, which is another reason why SpaceX's collaboration with NASA is an important and advantageous thing. Because as long as they continue this collaborative process, that means that they will probably be able to get access to nuclear propulsion and nuclear power for the future in order to carry out what Elon wants to do. And I don't think NASA is going to have a problem with what Elon wants to do, even though you know, they may not be all that enthusiastic, even though NASA may not be all that enthusiastic about the idea of a permanent settlement on Mars. I don't think they're going to argue with it. I don't think they'll try to stop Elon from doing it. So we've already got a lot of steps here, obviously. We've got reusability needs to be mastered. Low Earth orbit refueling needs to be mastered need to make a really good, resilient, and long-lasting life support system. That's very, very critical. And what do we need after that? Well, also, the challenge of landing on Mars is an extreme one. This is something I used to talk about a lot more frequently in some of my older videos. I call it the Starship Suicide Dive. And that is, in many regards, what it actually is. It is a very, the a starship re-entry is orders of magnitude more difficult than a re-entry here on Earth. Why? Because Mars has a very, very, very thin atmosphere. We're talking less than 1% of the density of Earth's atmosphere. That being the case, then, the amount of velocity that you bleed off in the atmosphere is far, far, far less than what you bleed off in Earth's atmosphere. And so what you're, what's probably going to end up happening is one starship bleeds off a certain amount of speed, it's going to be traveling at terminal velocity by the time it's approaching the surface of Mars. Terminal velocity on Mars is a thousand kilometers per hour. On Earth, terminal velocity is more between 200 to 250, depending on the configuration of your ship, you know, flaps, fins, anything that might be able to slow you down a bit more. Terminal velocity, again, about 200 kilometers per hour, which is roughly what we've been seeing on the, uh, on the occasions where Starship has done its landing uh, practice, the landing practice that it did with SN10, SN9, etc. So you're going to be taking the difficulty of that, of the landings that we saw with SN15 and so on, and really hyping that up. I mean, it's going to be a lot more difficult to try to land on the surface of Mars than it is to land, you know, on a concrete landing pad at Boca Chica. Far more difficult. And so that's going to have to be something that SpaceX practices repeatedly with unmanned missions before we can risk putting human beings um, into that situation. So, yeah, um, that's, again, another tall order. But, you know, once you have that 
And if you have a life support system that's going to last, you know, a couple of years long enough in order to sustain you through the mission, well, you're pretty much done at that point, at least for the initial mission to Mars. Starship is more than big enough to serve as a base for the astronauts to operate out of. It's large enough to carry a rover, probably multiple rovers on the red planet. So you can have, and if you have rovers, you have mobility, you can explore a great distance away from the ship um, utilizing that. Also, it will be nice to have some mobile habitats um, that you can take with you. However, the rovers themselves may be able to operate as mobile habitats. A pressurized rover, you may not need to have, you know, a mobile base to set up or take down. Um, a mobile habitat may be able to serve that purpose for you. And by the way, this is another example of why moon to Mars makes sense because the Toyota um, moon cruiser is designed to be just that. The Toyota moon cruiser is a mobile habitat capable of keeping at least four astronauts alive for weeks, if not months, on the surface of the moon. Once we've determined that that works on the moon, it will definitely prove to be just as effective on the surface of Mars, if not more effective. Um, but there are some unique challenges also that will need to be dealt with. For example, the uh, Martian regolith is far more deadly than lunar regolith. Again, moon to Mars will help because we will learn how to deal with statically charged regolith on the moon and how maybe to get rid of that stuff. On Mars, it's going to be far more dangerous. It's more charged. It has a, a stronger electrical charge on it, and it's loaded with perchlorates. It's lethal stuff. Michael, thank you so much for the for the five dollars. We appreciate it. SpaceX need to test Starship's landing gear or a powered belly landing. Wicked, thank you so much for the ten dollars Canadian. More solutions are needed. Starship will require. A support system for Mars's moons, a communication network, even maybe hoppers. Yep. In order to make a really successful long-term presence on Mars, I agree. For a one-time mission or the first mission there might not need all of that, simply because Starship, you can put so much in Starship itself in terms of supplies, in terms of everything you need to survive on Mars for you know a couple of years. If the mission indeed takes that long, you know, again, if you have nuclear propulsion, you can make the mission even shorter and that makes it even more doable. So we have to learn how to deal with perchlorates, dust storms, all of those unique problems. And by the way, if there is a dust storm that happens to get whipped up, while Starship is making its approach, if an unexpected weather system creates a dust storm and Starship has to try to land under those circumstances, it is going to be insanely dangerous. Insanely dangerous. Let's hope that that doesn't happen. Dust storms are full of statically charged dust. Um, therefore, a lot of potential for lightning, a lot of potential for electrical discharges as the ship is flying through the atmosphere. All we can do is let's hope, you know, we don't have to contend with that during a landing. Um, that, that might be pretty nasty. And by the way, that is kind of one of the challenges of SpaceX's plan for getting to Mars and landing on Mars. There isn't enough propellant left in Starship in order to put Starship into orbit. Another good thing about nuclear propulsion, by the way, because nuclear propulsion will allow for that. So in other words, it makes its approach, it hits the atmosphere and lands. You get one shot at it um, based on their current mission configurations. In my opinion, it's much better to put it in orbit than take some time to decide where you're going to land. I really think that that's a better plan, but that is not the current plan. Uh, Marina says, I'm expecting uh, when people get to Mars, they work with those rovers and bring them back to operational state. Oh, yeah, the, the rovers that are already there. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's another good point. Um, Mars is cold, uh, keeping water liquid. Well, you know, Mars being cold, 
will create all kinds of unique problems. Life support, you know, the power for life support will be considerable power requirements simply because the temperatures on Mars, especially at night, not necessarily during the day, but the temperatures at night become horrific on Mars. And so, yeah, you're going to need the necessary power in order to heat starships and nuclear power is the best solution. Once again, you could probably do it with solar, but nevertheless, nuclear power is still your best solution. And by the way, that is another important point. I'm glad somebody brought up how cold it is. Um, by the way, thank you, Robert. Really appreciate that. Thank you for the $10. Um, really appreciate all the support I'm getting tonight. Thanks so much, folks. Um, the temperature and and the difficulty of you know of heating a life support enclosure, it becomes a lot easier if the temperature isn't as bad. And the place where the temperature is one of the best locations is at the equator. And for those of you who have seen one of my recent videos that I released about that volcano we found on Mars, close to the Noctis Labyrinthus, which is a network of, of canyons, a very complex maze. That's why it's called Labyrinthus. Um, and between that and the uh, Valles Marineris on the other side is a flat plain. It's a plain that would be a great place to land a starship. In addition to that, it's warm, relatively warm, because it's at the equator. That makes a very big difference. And we think there's a massive treasure trove of water ice there. That, in my opinion, is where our first landing needs to be. I mean, aside from the fact that some of the most amazing and spectacular features on Mars are right there. The Valles Marineris being many times deeper than the deepest passages on the Grand Canyon. The uh, nearby Tharsis Plain with those volcanoes that are absolutely colossal. Um, wicked. Wow. And then John, a total of 10 extra angry astronaut memberships. You get a membership. You get a membership right at the end of the broadcast. Thank you so much, guys, for doing that. And by the way, all these new members, I can't wait to meet all of you. And again, you will get a notification here very soon um, explaining to you how to join the uh, Discord server. Thank you so much um, for, uh, for all that, guys. Thank you for introducing a lot of folks uh, to the Angry Advocate uh, community. It's very nice of you. So, so once again, to conclude... <laughs> If, if it's, and I'm not sure if I'm going to remember all these things, reusability, low earth orbit refueling, a resilient life support system, learning how to land on Mars, dealing with a lot of the environmental challenges that exist there. All of these things we need to master before we can land human beings on the red planet. Can we do that by 2030? Maybe. If SpaceX and everybody else stays focused, keeps their eyes on the prize, if Elon Musk recognizes that this is the most important thing that he's working on right now, he has a lot of irons in the fire, but this is the most important one. If he stays focused on this and keeps SpaceX at it, keeps, you know, and stays the course, I believe 2030 is very doable. And certainly, I think all, everybody on this uh, joining me here on this live stream me that this is what we want. Thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks so much for your support. And as always, stay angry about space.